In the world of Major League Baseball, it has been said that the top team in a league on July 4th in a given year will eventually win the coveted pennant later in the season. In 1965, an elementary school student with a love for the Philadelphia Phillies chose to explore this idea. He decided to create a statistical analysis to assess the last 50 or so seasons in baseball, evaluating the accuracy of the popular claim. At the time, a now-defunct newspaper called the Philadelphia Bulletin would call the young boy, quote, the most qualified 11-year-old oddsmaker. Little did the publication know that 11-year-old Larry Summers would become one of the world's most preeminent economists, taking his analysis far beyond the outfield of baseball. My name is Faz Zuffer, and this is Profiles in Excellence, a podcast brought to you by the Harvard College Podcast Network. Every Sunday, we feature successful individuals from politics, entertainment, sports, and more. From the journey of an Olympic gold medalist to the rise of one of America's most prominent economists, each episode will offer a glimpse at the world through the stories and perspectives of its most inspiring figures. For the next 20 minutes, join us. Today's guest is the 71st Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, 27th President of Harvard University, and former Chief Economist at the World Bank, Larry Summers. Dr. Henry Kissinger once said that Larry Summers ought to receive a permanent position at the White House to shoot down bad ideas. His suggestion clearly holds merit, as Dr. Lawrence H. Summers has held notable positions in two presidential administrations. As Jenna Smielak notes in the New York Times, when Dr. Summers speaks, Washington's policy apparatus stops to listen. Lawrence Summers was born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1954. His father, Robert, and mother, Anita, were also economists, and would later teach at the University of Pennsylvania. Two of his uncles, Paul Samuelson and Kenneth Arrow, would receive the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1970 and 1972, respectively. When I connected with Dr. Summers in July, we discussed his family history in the realm of economics. Please note that our conversation has been edited for the purpose of concision. Do you think it's fair to say that you were pretty much destined to embrace economics as an area of focus, sir? I've got two brothers, one of whom is a doctor, a psychiatrist, and the other of whom is a lawyer. So it wasn't faded in that sense. Uh, somebody joked uh, that my parents had three sons, one of whom went into law, one of whom went into medicine, and one of whom went into the family business. So maybe there was uh, an element uh, of that. Uh, I'm sure that the experience of growing up had something to uh, do with it. But uh, ultimately, I went into economics because I was intensely interested in public policy. And I was also intensely interested in being quantitative and analytical. And economics brought the two of them together. A young Larry Summers would enroll at MIT at the age of 16, where he would graduate in 1975 with a degree in economics. After receiving his PhD at Harvard, he would become one of the youngest tenured professors in the recent history of the institution, at the age of just 28 in 1983. Very unexpectedly, his world suddenly turned upside down when he was diagnosed with late-stage Hodgkin's disease. You know, at such a young age, when you were practically, in your mind, uh, at the top of the world, you know, what was going through your mind at that time? I was scared. It's uh, more scary than anything else that's happened to me. Maybe having had that happen to me when I was uh, young gave me some perspective on everything else, up or down, uh, that has uh, happened uh, since. I was angry. Um, it felt wrong and unfair. And I suppose I probably took some of that out on some of those who were involved in giving me health care um, uh, occasionally. But I made a decision early on to 
control what I could control and not control what I couldn't and to kind of continue living the life that I wanted to live, which meant uh, continuing to do my work. And at that time, it was sort of all economic uh, research. And it was a productive period for me as an economic researcher. I think if you look at my uh, CV, you'd not be able to tell when the interval was when I was uh, getting chemotherapy. And um, I was uh, proud of that. And obviously, my treatments uh, worked. And so I also learned early on that uh, a lot of what happens in life is about good luck uh, rather than uh, any uh, rather than anything else. And I have always sort of felt a need to uh, pay it forward. And so every month or so I encounter someone who's diagnosed with what I had or someone, something related. And I tell them the same thing, which is that there was a period of months when I couldn't go five minutes without thinking about my cancer. And then it was 15 minutes and then it was an hour and then it was a day and for a year for many years uh now it's been something that occurs to me only occasionally when i hear about somebody who's had something uh sad uh or or un- bad uh happen uh to them but i've thought that providing the support uh that it doesn't define uh one's life is very important. You know, Fez, you've obviously, for doing this uh, podcast, done some research on me. And so you, you know this, but, um, you know, when it first happened to me, I was very self-conscious about it, but I don't think the average student who encounters me in uh, their office hours ever has it occurs to them, there's Larry Summers, cancer survivor. And so I think it's, very important when one has these kinds of things, when one has any kind of tragic uh, something uh, to try to keep going and uh, to recognize that we all get to define who we are, not have it defined uh, by something that happens to us. With a new perspective on life, Dr. Summers continued his research. Though he briefly served as a senior staff economist on the Council of Economic Advisors under Ronald Reagan, Dr. Summers would venture further into the political arena when he began advising Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis in his 1988 presidential campaign. I found it incredibly exciting, and I also found it incredibly educational about what politics and the process of actually making public policy were like. I remember very early on, somebody explained to me that the campaign had 12 departments. It had finance, fundraising, it had scheduling, it had message, it had uh, com- it had uh, communications, um, it had a variety of departments of which issues was one. And I remember that came as a total surprise to me since I kind of thought issues was what a presidential campaign was about. And it was, in fact, one of the 12 departments and not the most important of uh, the 12 departments. I realized that there was a lot that went into public policy that wasn't captured in my models. And I also realized a little bit after that, that it was probably good in some ways that it was that way, because the experience of everyday people, the attitudes of constituencies, all of this was part of what made a system like the United States uh, function well. So I hope I taught uh the governor and his uh, senior campaign staff, some economics, I know they taught me a uh, 
great deal. And, you know, every time since then, when something happened to me, I became treasury secretary or uh, whatever. I always um, sent a note to uh, Governor Dukakis uh, thanking him for the opportunity he'd given me when I was young and unproven and I'm grateful to the uh, to T I had in uh, Lowell House, who was the deputy campaign manager of that campaign, who was the person who connected me and uh, brought me um, brought me on board. From 1991 to 93, Dr. Summers served as chief economist of the World Bank, where his work included a notable report underscoring the impact of investing in girls' education in developing nations. He would then join the Bill Clinton administration, first as the Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, then as Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, before being appointed to serve as the 71st Secretary of the U.S. Treasury. Amid his tenure in the White House throughout the 90s, Dr. Summers spent considerable focus addressing economic issues worldwide. In the Clinton administration, he was a key voice in formulating the response to crises in Russia and Mexico, among other countries. As you reflect on that decade of uh, policy experience, of which decision or action are you most proud? I think I'm probably most proud of uh, the first, res first crisis response uh, episode I was involved in. Um, Mexico at the beginning of 1995 faced a grave financial crisis that had the potential to, we thought, I think we were right looking back, destabilize the whole emerging market uh, sector in the way that the debt crisis of the 1980s uh, had. And uh, I, I, along with uh, Bob Rubin, along with Alan, Alan Greenspan, my role was to be supportive, but I, I was involved intellectually in driving uh, the policy, crafted a massive response based on a diagnosis of the situation as a kind of gigantic uh, bank. Uh, bank run. And that response was, at the time, uh, highly controversial. I remember one of the president's political advisors telling him that if, it, if that money didn't come back from Mexico, he wouldn't be coming back to the White House in the 1996 election. And I've always hugely admired the president's response to that. He said immediately, look, uh, this is what I'm here to do. If I make the decisions right, I'll get reelected. If I make too many of them wrong, I won't get reelected. But I'm here to do the right thing, uh, not to do the easy thing. And he turned to me and he said, uh, Larry, and Bob, and Alan, he said, do you guys think that if we do this, there's a realistic chance that we can save this situation? And do you think that if we don't do it, there's a significant risk of something cataclysmic happening? We answered those questions, yes. And he said, then I really have no choice. And the result was that. Uh, the Mexican economy was saved. They were able to pay us back. Actually, we earned a very small profit in less than a year. The relationship between the United States and Mexico got far stronger because we had lent a helping hand at, um, at, that, uh, at that moment. And um, you know, later uh, people celebrated this as one of the most important foreign policy accomplishments 
of uh, the Clinton administration. And I think that without the president's courage, um, without Secretary Rubin's uh, determination to do the right thing and without the credibility that he was able to uh, command, um, I don't think it uh, would have happened. And I think there would have been far reaching and unfortunate uh, consequences. So that's probably uh, the response of which I'm most proud, I'm probably most haunted by a set of questions about whether there's anything different we could have done in our support for the Soviet Union's transition um, after the Berlin Wall fell, where certainly the kind of outcome we have today with Vladimir Putin is not the outcome we were playing for, hoping for, or in many ways even imagining um, in that post-Cold War period. After President Clinton left office in 2001, Dr. Summers would become the 27th president of Harvard University. His leadership saw an increase in faculty-student interaction and the removal of financial obligation on families with a yearly income of less than $60,000. He would serve in this position until 2006. As you kind of look back on your experience as, as president of Harvard, was, was that something that you think uh, you enjoyed? Or were there really any formative experiences that you think came out of that? As I'll always be glad that I had the opportunity to uh, be uh, president of Harvard. I'll always be proud of things we accomplished, uh, establishing the principle that any family with an income below $60,000 could send their child to Harvard without uh, spending anything, starting initiatives like uh, the Broad Institute, the School of Engineering that have established Boston as uh, the center of uh, the life uh, sciences on uh, a global basis, doing a great deal to make the Harvard experience that you take for granted uh, something that was taken for granted, a freshman seminar uh, for all students, a reformed uh, curriculum, a college calendar that was in line with uh, the rest of the world, uh, study uh, abroad. I'll be proud of the fact that we established the principle that young faculty had a chance to get tenure and stay. Um, at Harvard. I remember that I was thrilled when I was able to give tenure to the first person who'd won tenure within the university by being promoted in the philosophy department in a century. Um, so there's a lot that I am very, very uh, proud of. I regret the turbulence and controversy that surrounded uh, many parts of my uh, presidency, that it didn't uh, go uh, longer. Certainly, I think I made uh, a variety of mistakes in trying to do too many things too fast, in not um, investing in building on tradition, uh, to a uh, sufficient uh, extent, but I'll let history be the judge. And I think if you look at where the university was in 2001, and you look at where the university was in 2006, and you look at what the main thrusts of its development um, have uh, been in uh, each of the uh, each of the areas. Um, even as I have many regrets, 
I'm very proud of what we were able to accomplish in that period. In November 2008, shortly after winning the year's presidential election, Barack Obama announced the incoming appointment of Dr. Summers to serve as director of the National Economic Council. In this position, he would play a considerable role in the Obama administration's battle against the Great Recession. Now, I think a great number of individuals listening, particularly those who may be younger, uh, may be unfamiliar or may not quite understand the economics of the situation that you were faced with. But from a human perspective, uh, when you were effectively tasked with helping the president repair a traumatized economy, uh, the likes of which the U.S. hadn't really seen for generations, what was going through your mind as you had to deal with an issue that was affecting not only everyone in America, but people around the world? You know, Fez, it gave me an empathy that I wish I had had at the time for the policymakers in um, the crisis countries I had worked with in the 1990s. It's very different when it's in your country. And I certainly never thought that the kind of crisis that Mexico had or Brazil had or South Korea had, that America would have a crisis of uh, that kind, uh, much less that I'd have important responsibility uh, for, uh, de for dealing with it. So it gave me empathy. You know, I thought that we had to approach it the way I approach almost all uh, problems, understand it, what are the fundamental forces driving it, think about what would be involved in um, the best possible solution, articulate what the constraints are to getting to that best possible solution and then uh move on and um that's kind of what i believe in as an approach to public policy and um that's what i tried to do uh supporting uh president obama you know i played a particularly close and active role in uh the automobile bailout uh, for students who are interested in a, in how not so much the big picture of government, but how a particular public policy issue is kind of worked through from beginning to end, I'd refer them to Steve Ratner, who led our um, auto team's book uh, overhaul about the automobile industry, and I think that was a very important act. Um, for the hundreds of thousands of people who were involved in working for those companies and their supply chains, for a crucial region of our uh, country, and more broadly for showing that sometimes government can solve problems, do things competently, effectively, and efficiently. And uh, after a bad accident, uh, pick up and get going again. That's what. Uh, we were able to, that's what I think we were able to do in supporting the automobile industry. And so I take a lot of satisfaction from that. During his tenure as director of the NEC, a movie called The Social Network was released in 2010. Narrating the story of Facebook's origin at Harvard amid Larry Summers' presidency, the film featured a scene depicting a conversation between Dr. Summers and Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss. Now, sir, the, this, this final question, uh, I ask it because I think a good number of people in our audience are probably familiar with this, but uh, you know, the 2010 film, The Social Network, uh, you know, tells the story of how Mark Zuckerberg raised Facebook at Harvard. And there's a prominent scene in the film uh, that, features, that features you portrayed by uh, Douglas Urbanski, uh, an actor and producer in Hollywood. Um, and, you know, I, I'm curious to hear what your take on that scene was. Was what, Do you think it was portrayed uh, how it actually happened, I guess, with the Winklevoss twins? Or what did you think about his portrayal of you? In a, um, in the sense in which um, 
caricatures sometimes capture truth better than photographs. Um, movie scenes sometimes capture better events better than a transcript of what actually uh, took place. I think it does capture uh, the spirit of uh, the meeting. Uh, the Winklevoss twins uh, came in with what seemed to me to be a rather entitled and uh, arrogant uh, attitude. And I responded in a way that reflected what seemed to me to be uh, their arrogant and entitled uh, attitude. Uh, this seems to me to be a, um, a relatively uh, clear example of a story with all happy endings. Um, Facebook has done very well. Mark Zuckerberg has had uh, enormous accomplishments. Uh, I think I suggest in the movie at some point that the Winklevoss twins find, find a new idea. They seem to have, uh, from what I read, uh, moved on in the cryptocurrency sphere and done uh, extraordinarily well. The movie uh, did, uh, did well. And is, uh, and is generally remembered. It gives me a funny, funny story to tell when people ask uh, questions. So I think this is a tale with happy endings, Fez. At the start of our interview, I noticed Dr. Summers sporting a New England Patriots shirt. As a fan of the past myself, I had to ask him this final question. Uh, what do you think the chances are for this upcoming season, sir? I I think the world I think they will long regret having let Tom Brady go. Oh, I was disappointed when that uh happened and it makes me um apprehensive about uh the prospects but uh my years since I came back uh to uh Boston after uh being at the treasury in 2009 have um have had a bit of extra pleasure because of uh, the Patriots and TB12's remarkable success. Larry Summers remains at Harvard as a professor, where he continues to enlighten generations of students with decades of experience at the forefront of the global stage. Were the Philadelphia Bulletin around today, I think we can all agree that it would have much more to say about this profile in excellence. 